which is somewhat better than the one that I was going to put up. Um, it's also great to see um, a, a number of new faces. Um, you know, I think flying in Scotland is a relatively contained affair. Um, and um, having flown for a number of years and lived up here for 22 years, you think you know most of the people who fly, but actually there are lots of people out there. So it's great to see new faces. Um, and um, I look forward to being in the air with you next year. No, not, not cooped up in a, in a, in a room like this. <laughs> so I guess I'm also an addict. Um, and unashamedly um, committed to, uh, to this. And for me, my particular form of addiction is cruising thousands of feet above the fantastic countryside we have in Scotland comparable with anywhere in the world. And on a, on a good day with a high cloud base, good clouds, light winds, and if we're really lucky, some good thermals. Mm -hmm. uh, I better stop there, otherwise I should get far too excited. <laughs> <laughs> so Warwick has given a bit, a bit of a re resume. Um, my BP um, result was actually um, the national champion um, of the BP oh. Cup in, in, in that year. And I guess that gave me a bit of a, um, a springboard to deciding that um, competitions were something that were worth, worth, worth doing. I'm not going to speak about competitions uh, tonight, but if anyone is interested in, in, in that side of things, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to talk later about that. I'm sure a lot of what I will say tonight won't be news to, to, to you, um, but I guess it's interesting to hear things that you're familiar with and enjoy from a different perspective. So I hope at least I can bring that to you. Um, and please, please don't be afraid of asking questions. But yes, 27 years um, is a long time flying. Um, and... Uh, I, I, I think I've learned a few things in, in that time, but it does surprise me every time I go out, um, I, I learn new things. Um, and I think it's the kind of sport that we do where if you don't have that attitude, um, then you miss out on a lot. Many hours in the air, and I have flown not all over the world, but I have had fairly extensive flying um, within the UK, Scotland, um, and, and, uh, and, and beyond. Um, I was talking over the curry uh, to Billy, who was saying, you know, so where are some good places to go? And I said, well, if you really want to get some good value, um, consistency and reliability, um, Colombia is hard to beat. Mm -hmm. um, it gets you out of some dreary weather in this part of the world um, into a very nice climate um, with a super atmosphere, friendly, cheap, reliable, you know, I'm not talking about Columbia, I'm talking about Scotland. <laughs> it is a good place to go to. It is a good place to go to. And I guess the other thing that kind of gives me some credibility for standing here is that I've had a few days um, when it's come together um, and I've ended up having a reasonable cross-country flight. Okay, so the beginning for me... Black magic, um, yeah, it's black magic, is it? Well spotted. Is it? Yeah, who said that? That was me. Okay, yeah, nice one. Yeah, so 27 years ago, uh, we flew things that looked more like inflated duvets uh, than paragliders. Um, and this is indeed a black magic, an airwave black magic, which at the time that it came out, kind of turned a few heads and it was a bit of a revolutionary thing. But when you look at it now, you think, oh my God, <laughs> did we really fly one, one, one of those? Um, Jockey Sanderson was the guy who taught me how to fly. Um, and at the time, I was an addicted climber. Um, I lived and breathed climbing. Um, I did little else. I worked in an environment where that's what we did. Um, I lived in the Lake District, and kind of pretty much any time I had some spare time, climbing was what I went out to do. But my uh, my younger brother was living in London at the time, and he was a hang glider pilot, and he clipped his wing um, up at home in the Lake District. <laughs> And I used to go out and watch him fly, and I thought it looked pretty good. But I couldn't really reconcile myself with the metal and the kit and carrying it up. And paragliding sounded like a much better option. 
uh, when Jockey Sanderson taught me how to fly on a sand dune in the Lake District on the West Coast, it literally blew me away. Uh, well, not exactly, but um, I was instantly addicted. And I think at that time I wasn't prepared for that. You know, I thought, well, there's nothing that can take away my addiction from climbing. And within the space of about an hour, it didn't happen. <laughs> my climbing world nearly fell apart. I think if it hadn't been for the fact that I was about to go on a climbing trip to Yosemite, I probably would have given up climbing there and then. Wow. I did take the wing to Yosemite um, and um, attempted to fly off one of the rock domes in Tuolumne Meadows. Uh, well, I had one of my first kind of lessons, and you can't necessarily just go and do what you like to do wherever you want. Because as I was laying out my glider on top of this rock dome, a jeep screamed up the valley several hundred feet below, and a park ranger leapt out and got a megaphone and said, You there! You with the paraglider! Pack up and come down now! And I went, <laughs> so, um, yeah. Seemingly, it is illegal to fly paragliders and swallow me. Um, and I, I, I never tried again when I was out there. So I took it all the way out there and, um, and came all the way back with it. So the early days of paragliding, particularly for us in the lakes, was all about going to new hillsides, new venues that we could launch from and fly from. And we would spend days going to new places, not to go anywhere other than to launch from and fly off these places. But wings grew and developed uh, and, and, and evolved, um, and gradually we started to think about what might be possible uh, beyond simply flying on the same bit of ground. Um, here I'm actually flying an Edel Rainbow. Um, and uh, it, was, it remains one of my favourite gliders of all time. It just was a beautiful thing to behold. What's the aspect of this one? It looks pretty skinny. Yeah, well at the time they, they, old, they were pretty skinny. I can't you? remember, it's approaching six, I guess, six, six point something. Mm. I, I actually still have it in my loft, <laughs> um, and I keep threatening myself to take it out and see what it, uh, what it was like compared to wings these, these days. Um, yeah. So things did eventually develop, and I, I, I guess for us it took about three years before we went on a decent cross-country flight. So if you compare that to pilots who come to the sport now, they get wings that are really um, capable of, of flying cross-country. There's an expectation that that's what you come into the sport for. Um, and within, you know, a short time after kind of uh, getting your CP license, you're, you're, you're away flying cross-country. Well, that was not how, how, how the sport evolved for us. But as cross-country flying began to develop, the Cumbria Soaring Club um, initiated its own cross-country league. Um, and um, it was quite a kind of uh, an, an active scene. People started to go cross-country um, and really get keen on, on that aspect of flying. Um, and if, if, if a anyone is thinking about that uh, kind of in the early days of, of the sport for yourselves, I would highly recommend recording your flights and entering them into a league, whether that's through your club or at a national level. It's a great way of motivating yourself and improving your flying. Having a goal to aim for is, is, is just fantastic. One of the things that the Cumbria Soaring Club also did, which was just great fun, was they introduced flying after six o'clock in the afternoon earned you double points. Mm -hmm. And being a competitive beast that I am, that was pretty appealing. So this was a flight that I did across the Lake District where I waited for about two hours on the hill <laughs> simply to get to six o'clock um, and, uh, and, and take off. But I guess the other thing for me about this particular flight was it was one of the first decent cross-country flights that I'd done. It took me right across the Lake District and it really began to show what the possibilities were of flying in the mountains. Um, and this was just a magical flight, um, I, I guess partly because of the time of the day, 
Um, I never got very high. I was never more than about a couple hundred feet above the ridge tops, and it was very much a journey through <coughs> the mountains. Um, and it was all the more special uh, because of that. But it really opened my eyes as to what might be possible. Shortly after that, work took me to Scotland. Um, and having had many years flying in, in the Lake District, um, Scotland was just a whole new ball game. Uh, this was an early flight, or well, my first flight. I nearly gave it away to this particular mountain. <laughs> it was actually on the 1st of May, 1999. Um, and um, I just got terribly excited about flying in this kind of terrain, in, in, in this kind of scale. It was just totally different from the Lake District. Um, it was big, it was scary. Um, it was often not easy to get to your launch, and when you did, um, it wasn't the nice grassy hillside of the, of the Lake District. But that effort just seemed to be something worth uh, trying to pursue and and develop further. However, I quickly realised um, that this was not the Lake District, and I had to develop a different kind of mentality and attitude to to mm -hmm. flying in the bigger terrain of Scotland. And the, some of the things that immediately became apparent was the scale of the place, um, and it made choosing where you were going to go on a particular day so much more difficult. The Lake District, by comparison, had been totally compact. Within an hour, I could get to most of the flying sites um, in the lakes. Well, you, you've hardly started your day in Scotland um, within that kind of time scale. And the terrain is complex. Um, I kind of knew the Lake District inside out. I'd, I'd worked in it in the outdoor industry, I'd walked all over it, um, I could land almost anywhere in the Lake District and I knew where I was and I knew that within an hour I could be back down in the road uh, somewhere safe. Um, I, I, I had no idea where I was in Scotland half the time um, and it was just a massive environment. And the other thing which kind of took me by surprise is that the season for flying in Scotland is really short. Um, so if you're a, if you're a committed cross-country pilot, expect to get your best flights in by the end of June. And that, that'd be, that's only half the year. Um, so yeah, March to June, end of, is the kind of optimal season in Scotland. And that seems pretty cruel, considering <laughs> the fantastic terrain that we've got. We get lots of it, weather, um, and, and the, the, the I'll say a bit more about the train and it's my view of how it's influenced, um, uh, how the weather is influenced by, by it, but it, it is massively influenced by the geography. <coughs> and I thought I was reasonably good at interpreting weather forecasts, uh, mm. working in the outdoors and being an outdoor instructor for many years, um, but suddenly I felt I had to learn from the ground up again, you know, how to interpret weather um, and make that work for me in, in, in terms of flying. Scotland seemed to behave differently um, and it didn't, uh, uh, you know, kind of follow the normal rules for me. And I was used to going to a hill on a good flyable day in the lakes and meeting lots of other pilots. Well, I spent my first 10 years fly trying to fly in Scotland and, and hardly ever meeting anyone. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, that, that became a challenge in, 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 in itself. And if you quickly don't accept that fact, then flying is going to be fairly limiting for you in, in, in Scotland. Um, you are eventually going to land out and you are eventually going to have a long walk. You just have to be prepared for that. It's, um, it, it, it's part of the game. So, the kind of mentality for your, your cross-country flying in Scotland kind of uh, kicks off in, in March. March, you begin to get days where it's feasibly flyable, um, and 
the ritual of watching the weather forecast begins. And RASP, for those of you, so the Regional Atmospheric Soaring Prediction, I think it's developed by Guy or Alicia kind of runs website, uh, used to work for Leeds University, um, and it's now become the premier kind of source of weather information for free flyers, originally developed for um, sailplanes, um, but kind of evolved and, and scaled accordingly uh, for, for us foot-launched pilots. It's not foolproof, um, but it's certainly uh, the thing that kind of kicks off, yep, it looks like it's going to be a, a, a good day. Um, and one of the, the, the little kind of features of it is the star system. Mm -hmm. So you can go onto RASP, have a look at the weather, and if it's four or five star predicted day, then everybody starts getting very excited. Okay, it's not the only source of weather out there, and <coughs> I'm no expert by any means at all, uh, but there are some great sources that I think you need to look at um, on a regular basis, get familiar with, it, with what it's telling you, um, and, and, and what that is by comparison to, um, to RASP and, and, and the other sites you might look at. So the ones that I look at on a regular basis are the Mountain Weather Information Service <laughs> Five Day Synoptics, that gives you an indication of the general pattern of weather and what's likely to, to be coming through. I look at sat24.com, which has a brilliant radar um, uh, map, and, and certainly very close to, to the day you're flying, that's going to give you a, a pretty accurate information of, of what's likely to be hitting you um, that, that day. And there's some good forecast information on that site as well. Uh, Windy.com um, is a great uh, weather site and one of the really cool features of that is that it gives you weather uh, and uh, wind uh, direction and speed at different altitudes. And you can zoom right into topographical maps um, on that, uh, areas that you might want to fly and you get a pretty good assessment um, and prediction of what the weather, uh, the wind is doing um, at different altitudes. Um, and, and the BBC weather forecast is, is, is kind of frequent, it's, it's, it's updated regularly, um, and, and I think it's often pretty reliable. Find out what others are thinking about. Okay, there's some great information out there. Um, get, get hold of you know, some regular buddies who you might want to go flying with. Um, see what they're thinking. And also, decide how far you want to go. So I live in Fort William. Um, I've got flying friends who live in Glasgow, Edinburgh and Aberdeen. And I'm the only pilot in Fort William. So I know on a good flying day, I often have to decide how far am I prepared to drive. Um, and it, uh, it can significantly influence the decisions for you on, 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 on a day. And I think having some idea of what you want to do will enable you to kind of make the best decisions. It's very easy to waste time uh, deciding what you want to do, where you're going to go. Um, but if you've got some idea of the kind of flying you want to do or the sort of area you want to get to, if, if everything else conspires to get you there, then that's great. Head, head, head off to there. So we started with getting very excited three, four days out. Um, and if things continue to look good, double check the information that you were originally making your decisions on. So look at RASP in more detail the evening before and again in the morning. So, you know, a good flying day will get you up at 6 o'clock in the morning. You get the 6.30 update on, on the weather forecast from RASP. Um, and that really begins to shape um, what you're going to do and, and, and where you're going to go. And there's some particular things that I look at on, on RASP. Um, and um, these, these are them. So I look at the boundary layer average wind, which is the layer of the atmosphere that we typically fly in. I look at the thermal updraft velocity, and that's the average dry thermal strength um, of the day. I look at the height of the critical updraft strength, 
um, and that's the height at which average updrafts drop below one meter per second. And below that, then it's of no value to us um, as, as, as paragliders. Other good places where there is potential for cumulus, um, and that's the height at which good cumulus may form. I look at the boundary layer max up and down, which is an indication of convergence. Um, it's not so reliable uh, uh, as a parameter, uh, but it might give some indication of shear lines um, or convergence, which could be coastal or, or mountain. Um, and th there's a little video that, that kind of might, might make a bit more sense of what, what I'm talking about in terms of these parameters. I also look at the normalized sun, uh, which is the amount of sun reaching the ground or where cloud might block out sun and therefore reduce thermic activity. And if I think it's likely to be on the windy side, then I'll also check uh, the buoyancy shear ratio, which gives an indication of whether thermals are likely to be disrupted uh, by the strength of the wind um, or, or, or not. Okay, so what does all that mean when, when you're actually looking at RASP? When I, I look at RASP, I start at 12 o'clock and I try and look at each of those parameters for every two hours through the day till about 6 o'clock. So just bear with me on this. So the star rating, the red and the orange and yellow are the things we're looking for. So this was a day in early July this year. Boundary layer average wind is light, bottom blue in the blue spectrum. Um, I'll say a bit more about wind, but light wind in Scotland is good. So the yellow bands are a kind of indication of convergence lines that might develop during the day which are lines that might be helpful for, you know, staying up in um, and, and, and travelling distance. Height of cloud base. So I find I have to kind of get into a bit of a routine when I'm going through this and be quite methodical um, and um, and see what the changes are in each of those parameters through the day um, or through the flying part of the day, you know, between 12 and 6 o'clock. So the buoyancy shear ratio is uh, where wind is likely to influence um, the integrity of thermals, and if the value is five or less, then you're likely to have wind that's going to be too much, um, or, or kind of be disruptive during, during the day. Um, so if the colour pattern um, is uh, you know up in the orange and reds and purples, then things are looking good. Okay, of course, weather is not the only thing that you need to kind of get sorted and prepared uh, for a good cross-country day. Um, everybody will have their own kind of preferences on, on instruments, but make sure that the setup you've got um, is, uh, is uh, reliable and they're charged and ready the night before. And remember, you're in the Highlands, things can change very quickly. Okay, so um, not in any particular order, but things that I think can kind of influence um, success and give you a little bit more chance of, 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 of having a good day. Now, now, this is my own thoughts and theory. I reckon the Highlands of Scotland behave a little bit like flatland flying with the difference that there are some large lumps thrown in, <laughs> which makes life complicated. Um, so the, 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 the valley systems in the highlands do not work like they do in the Alps, whereby 
the height difference between the tops of the mountains and the valleys generally precludes wind developing early in the day in, 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 in the valleys. The sun heats up the air in the valley and you get nice, nice thermic um, uh, currents rising up and you can kind of fly the valleys by the, the sunny slopes um, dur during the day. Scotland does not behave like that. Um, and wind is often the limiting factor in Scotland um, uh, in terms of whether it will be flyable or, or, or not, or at least produce a good flyable day. And our best days rely on light wind. Uh, and you need to give yourself a good starting point. It's really tempting in Scotland not to walk high enough. Mm -hmm. um, but bear in mind, you need a light wind day. The higher you walk, the more chance you have launching and getting into that first thermic cycle and starting your day. If you blow that, you've probably wasted an hour, if not more, of time and effort and energy. And there's nothing more demoralizing than walking halfway up, thinking an hour's walk, will do, that'll do me, I'll get some nice points. Launching, not connecting with anything, landing at the bottom and thinking, right, if I'm going to make anything useful this day, I've got to walk all the way back up again and start all over again. So put in that extra effort, walk to the top, give yourself that really good start um, and, uh, and, and launch point. I've said it before, but I think having a plan and a task in mind with some options um, is, um, is, is a great thing to do. It gives you some focus and it gives you a purpose for the day. Whether that might be just flying to the end of the region back again, um, or flying to a particular point, um, have something to aim for. It gives you purpose and focus. Yeah, don't just walk blindly up the hill. Do check what's happening um, in reality against what you thought was going to happen for the day, um, and, and kind of be prepared to modify um, as you go. That's a bit of a trite statement in, in many respects, um, but being able to thermal well is really key to having a good cross-country flight. Um, and there are things you can do to, to help improve that aspect of your flying. So one of the things is, whenever you go flying with someone, never let them out thermally. Always try and maintain, you know, a kind of a better thermal rate than they, are, <coughs> they have. Try and get to the top of the stack, uh, and think about what you're doing when you're thermaling. Um, this might sound a bit scary um, for those who might fly with me, but I quite often fly with my eyes closed when I'm thermaling. <laughs> um, and I do that deliberately so that I can really tune into the feeling of the glider. And what I listen to is my vario, I try and ensure that the pitch is, uh, is maintaining or improving, and I really concentrate on smooth flying and feeling what the wind is doing. Yeah, of course, I do look around, um, but um, it's actually really interesting not looking at your instrument and the ground around you and, and just flying with your eyes closed, feeling what the wind, the, the wing is doing. So light winds, flat land flying, but big lumps in the way, staying high in Scotland um, is really important. Um, and that often means that you're not going to be racing around the sky. You need to be patient, um, and, um, and really work at, at staying high. It can be very hard work when you get low in the valley, against a big face um, in, in, in Scotland, and, and it, it, it adds to your stress level immensely. So stay, don't give up, really persist and be patient, work hard. Flying with others can really help. Um, and if you've got, you know, a, a kind of group of you who are prepared to get out and, you know, go for things um, and, and discuss options and, uh, what, you know, what the potential of the day is, um, then I'd really kind of encourage a little group together. Um, I, I, I think in the last two, three, four years, um, the amount of people who are getting out flying in Scotland who are really...
going with a purpose um, and, uh, and, and trying to do things um, has been fantastic. And I think the quality of flying that's developed in, in, in the last uh, few years in Scotland has been superb. Um, and I think that's largely as a result of people kind of pooling their experience um, and talking about what they want to do um, and, um, and, and sharing resor resources. Yeah, you do have to accept that landing out is part of the game. I mentioned a little bit about that before. Um, I guess by reliable, um, I mean you need to have a system that's not going to run out of battery. You need to have a system that uh, gives you the kind of information that you can use um, easily and readily, um, and it's not overly complicated. And there are some great bits of kit out there um, that, uh, that, that can work well for you. So don't just go for the most expensive thing. Don't just go with something that somebody else thinks is, is good. Research what you think will work for you um, and, and get a system um, that uh, will really give you the information that you can use. Ha. Well, if anyone can give me this solution to gloves, speak to me afterwards. As a, as a winter climber and as a flyer, I must have about 15 pairs of gloves. Um, and I don't think I've yet found the perfect solution. Um, <clears throat> our season is short. Our best flying is uh, springtime, and at 6,000 feet above the highlands in Scotland in spring, it's cold. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing worse than um, ensuring that you're going to land quickly than having cold hands. So whether it's a pair of heated gloves um, or some good liners, get a system of gloves that really works for you. Um, clothing is, is um, pretty, pretty straightforward. You know, there's lots of... Uh, an outdoor kit that's, that's great out there, and the, the advent of pod harnesses um, has made life um, a dream. Uh, we're much more protected, we're much um, uh, cosier than we ever used to be. Um, it cuts the wind out, um, it, uh, it makes life really good. But you do need some good clothing. You're going to walk off in a long way um, at the start of the day, um, and you need to be prepared to get kind of hot and sweaty, but then also make sure that it's going to work for you when you're actually flying. Um, you're constantly in a, a, a windy environment when you're flying. It may not feel like it, um, but um, you know, if you've got chinks in your clothing and, and your gloves, then you're gonna get cold, you're gonna get miserable, and you're probably gonna land fairly quickly. Develop a, a pre-flight check routine. Um, I can't emphasize how important this, di 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 this is. Um, having seen people launch and watch their reserve drop out of the harness um, and then crash to the ground, um, there are some really simple things that you should get um, into an absolute routine about every time you go flying. Um, and they include checking your lines, uh, that they're intact, they're not frayed, there are no knots, Make sure your rise is connected to your harness correctly. Make sure your reserve is, is in its container and secure. If you carry a radio, make sure it's charged and it's on. And I carry a spot, uh, which is a kind of a personal tracker. Um, and I think if you're going to think about flying in, in <coughs> Scotland, in some of the more remote places, it's, um, it's an invaluable thing to have. Um, it makes, for my wife, it makes life much more reassuring. She knows where I am. She knows I can contact her if needs be. Um, and it can, if you coordinate things, make life easier in terms of retrieving um, each other at, at, at the end of the day. Um, but the primary purpose for me is, is, is my personal safety uh, and, and knowing that I can get help if, if, if I need to. By that I mean make sure that you've got the skills and confidence to kind of launch and land wherever that might be. Um, we are frequently launching from mountain tops. Uh, we're frequently launching from places that are not immediately straightforward. They're not like the smooth grassy slopes of the Lake District. So you need to be confident that your skills with the glider on the ground 
um, are good. Um, you can't do enough practice ground handling. End, end of. Uh, the best pilots in the world spend as much time ground handling as they do flying. Okay, there are a couple of, can't sure, I'm not sure what the quality of the picture is like for you, there are, there are a couple of gliders in, in this picture, one there, and one there. Um, this is actually a day, um, or one of the North-South Cup days, um, and I always think, while it shouldn't be constantly in your mind, at any given point you should know where you can land and where you can glide to. And once you've sorted that out, you can then forget about it, um, and you can relax and, and concentrate on, on the flying ahead of time. But if you suddenly need to decide, um, in, 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 in a bit more urgency, where you think you might need to land, and you haven't worked it out beforehand, then it, kind of, it, it might be a bit too late. So, just some examples for these two guys. You know, there are some free valleys that he might think, okay, yep, if it needs to be and I, can, I, I have to land, I, I, can, I can aim for there. And likewise, for, the, for that pilot there. So, always good to have some indication for yourself of where you think <coughs> you can glide to um, if you need to get out of situations. I carry a radio, um, and I think a radio can be invaluable um, in terms of adding to the quality of the day, gives you an opportunity to talk with your flying buddies, uh, to discuss what's happening. Um, but I would encourage you to be kind of clear and, and crisp about your communication. If you're flying with a group of people and you're all on the same radio channel, there, there's nothing more off-putting than having someone who's jabbering away um, you know, with, with a bit of nonsense on, on the radio. Is that Ben Bradle? <laughs> 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 Having said that... No, I meant the glider, not the radio. Uh, <laughs> no, no, it's, um, it's, that's, that's Tom... Tom Straker. Tom Straker. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Having said that, <laughs> there were a group of uh, pilots from the Lake District and the Pennines uh, who use radios extensively. Um, and... Um, Anyone who knows Barney Woodhead, um, uh, Barney FM became a sort of a <laughs> colloquial uh, reference uh, in, in the sport. But they use radios exceptionally well. And they would frequently come up to the Highlands and did some outstanding flights. And I think a lot of the success of, of their flying was due to their preparation but also their really skillful use of radios to keep in touch with each other, um, relay information about what's happening, um, and enable them to fly together really effectively. So it can be a great tool. So it is a big environment out there when you're flying, and it's very easy to kind of, kind of get locked into your little bubble, um, where you're heading for, um, your particular bit of ground that you're thermaling over, or whatever. But being aware of the wider picture, um, particularly in our environment, I think is, is really important. So I, I'm not sure whether you can kind of see in this picture, but off in the distance there is some rain, pretty heavy rain shower coming out of those clouds. Mm -hmm. And that was tracking uh, towards us. We were flying, in this picture, we were flying um, to, the, to the left, <coughs> uh, to a particular turn point, and we were going to be heading back um, into the depth of the picture. And we knew that that rain was coming, potentially, to influence our return journey. So it was really important that we kind of spotted that um, and kept an, an, an eye out on it and, and the influence that it might, might have. But yes, so keeping a wider perspective is important. Um, so I talked about Colombia being a really good place to fly. Um, well, I got suckered into um, being very focused uh, there one year. Uh, I was flying quite close into the terrain, um, and I caught sight of this buzzard, this vulture, flying ahead of me, and I was convinced it was going to lead me into some good lift. So 
So I latched onto it. Uh, all I could focus on was the bird. And I flew around the corner of this hill uh, I I into some really kind of restricted terrain. I was so convinced that the bird was going to find some lift, thermal out, and now I'd, <coughs> I'd be able to use the lift it found. Well, I think all it did was to fly into a nest, <laughs> <laughs> which left me completely screwed. Um, and I ended up more or less having to do a kind of a crash slope landing. A classic example of not keeping my eyes open um, or, 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 and, and the wider environment. So it's not always possible to stay high. I said staying high in Scotland is, is really important for, for a good um, cross-country day. Um, that's just not always possible. You are inevitably going to end up having to get close in to the terrain. And I think you need to know where your comfort margins are and how close you are prepared to keep into the terrain. Um, so that red line is an obvious route to take. Um, it increases your margin of safety, gets you out the way from the, uh, the jaggy terrain, but it might run the risk of taking you into an area of weak lift um, and uh, reduce your chance of staying up and carrying on. Oh, sorry. Damn, I can't go back. <laughs> so the green line, second, if you yeah. split a second, yeah. caught that, which is a curvy line, uh, we were going into wind, around, but keeping tight into that bigger cliff was the root option for, on, on that occasion. Um, but you need to know how comfortable you, you are in, in, in that environment. I, I have once taken it too close and had my wingtip brush the side of a crag. Uh, I got away with it, I was really lucky. It could so easily have snagged and spun me in. Um, but staying tight into terrain um, can be the, the difference of get, keeping in lift or losing it and, uh, and landing out. So similar to keeping your eyes open for the big picture um, is kind of always thinking a couple of steps ahead to where might your next best bit of lift be. Um, on this particular day, actually somewhere ahead um, above that obvious little pointy hill um, and the good cloud is, uh, is Tim Bridal um, on his way to a 160 kilometre flight from Aberfoyle, um, which um, I think probably is now the internal Scottish distance record. Mm -hmm. um, so brilliant, brilliant effort by, 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 by Tim. Had to be a Wednesday though, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that from, from where we're, we're, we're looking here, that would be the obvious place to aim for, for your next bit of good lift. There's a nice uh, thermal trigger in terms of the hill, uh, there's good cloud forming above it, but it looks a little bit kind of weak beyond there. So you might decide that that obvious choice is not the one to go for. You might decide to go for um, <coughs> a bit of a deeper line. You're further away from any kind of point of safety. If you land out, you have a longer walk. But there is the prospect of a line of much better clouds downwind. Um, so. Those are the kind of decisions you need to be prepared to make and, and, and be thinking about kind of before you get there. Yeah, sometimes it's not obvious. Sometimes you just climb up, you get into that thermal and you go on a glide, and you go on a glide, and you go on a glide, and you just have to hope and pray that there is something. Um, but you don't have to simply fly blind. Um, in, in, in the hope. Um, you know, staying above sunny ground is going to in increase the, the chance of, uh, of getting into lift. Um, head to windward slopes. Um, keep your eyes open for thermal indicators. So there might be clouds forming, there might be a bird thermaling. Um, you might suddenly um, smell. The smell is coming up. And what's bringing the smell up is warm air rising from the ground an indicator of maybe a thermal somewhere around. Um, smoke. Um, you know, fires burning, watch for change in, 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 in the smoke drift. 
So I've, I've seen occasions when um, two smoke fires uh, with smoke going vertically as you approach, suddenly the smoke converges towards each other. Well, what, what is that telling me? It's telling me that there's a patch of rising air in between those two fires, drawing the smoke in as the air creates a, a kind of void as it rises. Good chance that there's, there's a thermal um, between those two fires. Um, you might see things rising. I've seen plastic bags, debris, being hoovered up in thermals. So keep your eyes open. There's lots of indicators um, out there. So this is Bob Matthews, seemingly over no man's land. Um, Bob is a brilliant pilot. He, he, he got thermal um, without any difficulty. Um, two Scottish pilots, uh, Jules Robinson, Matt Church, gliding on a day where there's lots of cloud development. Um, and while they're not conditions that we kind of get a huge amount of in, in terms of the UK, um, things can overdevelop. Um, and it's good to have some kind of indication of whether you can deal with that or, or, or not. Um, so how do you know whether it's safe to enter um, clouds or not? So one indication, um, a, a very kind of rough rule of thumb as to whether a cloud is safe uh, to be under or, or kind of close to is if the base is wider than it's tall, then the amount of lift that it's generating is probably manageable. Um, if it's the reverse, then you could, you could be in trouble. Um, I mean, cloud flying isn't, isn't particularly clever, but it's bloody good fun to do. <laughs> um, you just kind of need to be kind of fully aware of, 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 of what's happening. It's also good to know whether you can glide out from under a cloud or not. Um, and there are some fairly easy kind of ways of, 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 of judging that. So if you imagine an angle from you out to the edge of the cloud, um, if that angle relative to um, the ground is 45 degrees or more, then you are likely to be able to glide out. If that angle is less, then the distance you've got to be able to glide out uh, may not be feasible. You may get trapped under the cloud. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of rough and ready thing, but actually judging at 45 degrees isn't <laughs> too difficult. Um, you know, so that would suggest that looking from the harness up to the edge of the wing and out beyond might give you roughly 45 degrees uh, to the edge of the cloud. Convergence is something I don't know a huge amount about. Uh, it's not something that... Um, we get lots of practice of flying in, but there is a surprising amount of convergence even within Scotland. Um, when you look at the, kind of the maps of Scotland and distances, actually you're never that far away from the coast, um, and there are often coastal influences um, that will generate um, uh, convergence type conditions. But one indicator of whether convergence clouds are forming is the kind of a lowering of the edge of the, the, the clouds. So you can see that it's from sort of veils of cloud lowering down below the, 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 the obvious um, up, you know, general layer. And that would be a telltale um, that, this, that the, the lowering of the cloud is on the sea breeze side. And in this case, the sea breeze is coming in from the <coughs> other side of the mountain. Uh, from coastal influences. So I talked about instruments earlier, um, and but even with modern instruments, judging wind, speed and direction <coughs> when you're out flying mm -hmm. is not always easy. Um, but you've got other things that can aid you in, in that process. So before it gets too late and you're committed to flying down some Nali Valley, and considering whether you need to land or not, um, perhaps identify an, an obvious cloud shadow on the ground and monitor its drift. 
Okay, that, that can be a really good indicator of wind speed and direction. Um, and remember that the, the, the terrain that we have often influences the, the general meteorological wind uh, quite significantly. Um, but that can be a really good little tool to kind of give you an in-flight indication. And you don't want to have your head locked in your instrument. You really need to be out there, be alert to what's going on, um, kind of see your flying and just use your instrument um, as, as, as a real backup. By comparison to the picture of yours and Matt, where there's heavy cloud, lots of development, some days are just largely blue. But that doesn't mean to say that there are no thermals around. Um, but if you're flying with other people, and you can stay um, in, in a well-formed gaggle, it can be a massive help. Um, so without the visual clues um, that you might have in, in other cases, your, your fellow pilots become the visual clues. Um, and if you can uh, fly well together, and then you can really make good use of a, of a blue day. A blue day doesn't mean there are no thermals. <laughs> okay, a bit of tongue in cheek, but occasionally it is quite useful. Um, and we also fly in amazing places. So this was the end of a good day, we'd achieved what we wanted to, but the conditions were so good, it was just stupid not to grab the opportunity to go play ab above this fantastic place. Mm. You should be out there enjoying it, um, uh, so do take account of where you are, um, enjoy the views. Whether you've got a camera or not, um, we, we fly over the most spectacular terrain and really unusual features sometimes just kind of grab your eye um, as, as, as you're flying. And no day is a good day until you've actually landed safely on the ground. Uh, this is George Robinson coming to land after a good uh, flight. It was a good, successfully declared out and return. Um, and we do, we do in, indulge in um, a hazardous pursuit. Um, there are, there are a, a number of people in this room who will know of uh, Brendan Reid, uh, one of Scotland's outstanding pilots, uh, who sadly had a really bad crash earlier this year um, and is still recovering in hospital in, in, in Glasgow. Um, anything that you can do to improve your safety, whether that's Improve your handling of the glider on the ground, your glider skills and handling in the air, anything you can do to make sure that you land safely at the end of the day um, is, is, is a good thing to, to practice and, and, and appreciate. So I have been to lots of places around the world and there is no doubt that when, 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 it, when you get a good day in Scotland, um, it is easily a match for any location that I've flown in, in the world. So this is just a detailed track log of a successful flight, which is a, a kind of a declared out and return. <coughs> Our start point was uh, Skufenisaig. Um, our first turn point was um, just out towards uh, <laughs> Dalwini um, and back. What, what was the wind direction that day? The wind direction that day was north westish. Yeah, we were flying sort of perpendicular. We were flying crosswind, yeah, yeah in, in both directions. Um, by the end of the day it turned a little bit west, um, so we had a bit of a push back into the final turn point, but I think actually what, what was happening to some extent was that it had, the, the wind was coming down like um, Archaic um, and then curving around. So although the, the Met wind was generally west, 
<coughs> actually became quite a helpful component um, close into we were able to get quite low in low um, scoop and a seg and almost surf up that final bit um, at, at, at the end of the day um, downloading your flights in this way um, is a really interesting way of analyzing what you've done and how you've done it um, and I think it's a really good way of kind of learning about how you fly um, and, and, and kind of making some improvements um, and um, if I can get this right so if, uh, if, if we look at that particular thermal in more detail um, and, and having downloaded it onto this um, um, XZ planner website, you can then just zoom right in. Um, you can have a look at your thermal track in, in a lot more detail and decide whether you are smooth in your thermaling. I think probably not here, a little <laughs> bit erratic. Um, so I probably could have been a little bit smoother and more efficient in my, in my thermaling there. Um, but it's a really good way of kind of looking at your flight um, and kind of learning from it rather than just simply saying, Okay, well that happened in the flight, and so what? So, so what of it? Um, I think the more you can kind of uh, analyse what you do and how you do it, gives you a chance to to to, to improve. Okay, so I've selected a number mm. of flights that have been done in Scotland over the last few years that I think are inspirational flights. Um, and things that we can all aspire to. Um, so I'll start with um, Tim's flight. This is a 160 kilometer straight line from Aberfoyle to Nan. But it shows that 200k, you know, has got to be possible in Scotland. Mm. Yeah. A flight that George Robinson did from Ben Toig. Uh, just north of Bridge of Walkie, over some great terrain up towards Glen Strathborough. Brendan Reid, a flight from west of the Cairngorms, uh, Neil Don, right over the Cairngorms, and then on <coughs> landing near Forfar. Mike Kavanagh, one of the Lake District Raiders. Um, again, for me, this is a really inspirational flight over some fantastic countryside. Um, so he flew from the low slopes of Garvan in Ardgour right the way up to Achenshin. I think he must have crossed three roads in that entire flight. Mm -hmm. Now, Brent, so Brendan features a lot here. He's had some just phenomenal flights. 150k from uh, above um, the rest of me thankful. Right across to uh, Glenesk. Mike again. The launch from above Loch Clooney, Glen Shiel. Flew all the way up to Inch and Damp and back down to Olapool. And when Brendan did this, from just south of um, Ben Nevis, all the way up to uh, yeah, Elgin, this was the Scottish record, 154k. Uh, a name that we don't hear much of these days, uh, fondly known as Trias. Um, Trias has a knack of just picking those really good days going out there and blasting some fantastic flights and he often did it, did it on his own um, I think his business is occupying so much of his time these days um, but when he does get out he usually has a good flight uh, so a really nice one from Ben Laws up over the Cairngorms mm -hmm. and beyond okay so flights in a little bit more detail so all the flights so far have been kind of straight line flights, more or less. Um, but uh, the, the kind of the defined flights and triangle flights in Scotland um, have been uh, have been fantastic. So this is a, 
This is a classic circuit from the White Corries um, in Glencoe, heading uh, southwest down Loch Etiv, across to uh, Glenorchy, and back up again. This is over magnificent terrain, a great objective. When Brendan did this, this was the first 100k FAI triangle flight done in the UK. So this is from uh, Ben Toeg up to Ben Nevis, out towards uh, Ben Alder, and back again across, across Rannoch Moor and the Blackwater Reservoir. Getting up to 8,000 feet. So that's, that's a really good day. Classic, that yeah. is a really good day in Scotland, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And when Jules did this flight, by comparison, only 6,000 feet, um, but an FAI triangle of 103, and it was declared that was a UK record. It's since been broken down south, um, but it's a great example of the sort of potential that, that exists in Scotland. Jules was brilliant in um, kind of planning and, 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 and um, going for this flight. He, he looked at the weather forecast in detail, and it, he predicted that he would have a helping wind on each leg of his flight. <laughs> um, and he started from here with a light northeasterly helping him, um, and the wind changed during the day. He had a northwesterly heading down to Loch Rannoch, um, and then he had a southerly helping him back to close his flight. It worked like a dream. I landed somewhere here and had a massive walkout. <laughs> But I had my train time pillow. <laughs> <laughs> I got the last train from Corral, otherwise I'd have had a horrible walk. So, those are just a selection of what I think are some really inspirational flights that are done in Scotland and give us all things to, uh, to aim for. Okay. That kind of concludes the first part. Um, I hope it's given you some indication of what the challenges of flying cross country <laughs> in the Highlands are, some of the things to kind of think about and prepare for, some of the things that will help you along the, that, that journey, um, and then some of what, what is also possible. So it's now an opportunity to uh, get competitive mm -hmm. um, and look at each of the, the pictures in, 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 uh, in full. Um, and uh, see where you go. <coughs> Can I ask a question? Please. So yeah, you said earlier on that the best time for cross country was before, did you say the end of June? Yeah. Okay. Why is that? Good man. Why is that? Um, so I don't actually know why that is, but oh, the weather pattern <laughs> in Scotland <laughs> yeah. is such that the spring up until you know early summer yeah. is when we get our best flying. Good days in the summer in Scotland tend to produce high pressure days when there's little vertical movement of the air mass mm -hmm. and um, the ground is often wetter um, and we just don't get good reliable flying days um, beyond, yeah. beyond, beyond July. Is it anything to do with the winter just being over and the ground being colder and now there's sort of hot weather coming? Yeah, I think that, that must be a factor. Mm. So those early spring days when you've got kind of cold air mass down at ground level yeah. With the capacity of heating up and forming right. those good thermic currents, yeah, that, that, that has to be part of the, part of the equation. I was a bit disappointed when you said that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. And so, you know, I, I, I remember a year when the, the National Cross Country League was won by someone flying down south, and I think virtually all of his qualifying flights yeah. were done in August and September. And of that year, I didn't fly once in Scotland in those months. And he got all of his six qualifying flights to win the league down south okay. in those months. Mm -hmm. That's that. Yep. Oh, thanks, Tony. Thank you very much.